I'm listening for what the trigger or triggers might be in somebody. And addressing those triggers, I think, is really critical because those triggers, there's this line that you hear in spiritual work, never waste a good trigger. Really understanding what your triggers are and using those as part of your map, what to address. I gotta get myself a little more faith, a little more love. I'm your host, Krista Bigler, and I'm going to guess we have at least one thing in common, that we're both in pursuit of a less stressed life. On this show, I'll be interviewing experts and sharing clinical pearls from my years of practice to support high-performing, health-savvy women in pursuit of abundance and a less stressed life. One of my beliefs is that we always have options for getting the results we want. So let's see what's out there together. All right, today on The Less Stressed Life, I have Sarah. And I forgot to ask her the new pronunciation of her maiden name, so she'll tell us in a moment. I'm going to just take a stab at Sazal Godfried. (laughs) She is a physician, researcher, author, and educator. She graduated from Harvard Medical School and MIT, but she's more likely to prescribe a CGM and personalized nutrition than the latest pharmaceutical. She's a global keynote speaker, author of four New York Times bestselling books about hormones, nutrition, and health. And her latest book is called The Automoon Cure, which... Today, as we're recording this, was released yesterday, so it's released March 2024. She's currently a professor in the Department of Integrative Medicine and Nutritional Sciences at Thomas Jefferson University, and her professional focus and extra interests include wearable technology and how to use these tools for improving health outcomes and N of one trial design. So this is your super nerding shows in this last sentence, which I appreciate so much. This is exactly (laughs) like how my brain thinks. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Krista. So happy to be with you. Yeah, I'm happy to have you in in our brains. And we all have our stereotypes. When I see your name, I think of as the hormone doctor. And today there is a shift. We're talking about autoimmunity, which is everyone knows someone touched by autoimmunity. It's almost hard to even define the entire umbrella. There's skin conditions that I work with that are almost questionable, right, around the autoimmunity. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how, I feel like if you're going to burr the book, and I know this book took longer to write than the other books, I feel like if you're going to burr the baby like this, there's some new passion. And here's the thing, you have covered huge, like big topics, right? Like these are big topics to swing from, and it's not good or bad, it's just, it's an undertaking, I feel. So if you're going to burr the baby like this, tell me why this (laughs) happened. Why did you feel after the time in hormones that you felt called to the autoimmune space or so more so to to write a book with and we didn't talk about this but it's got a really good tagline or subtitle right so we'll I'll let you talk about that too a little bit it may seem like switching from hormones to autoimmunity is a big shift it's not really they're so interdependent and Yes, I started with hormone imbalances because that's what I was faced with when I was in my 30s. I had one baby and I went to my doctor just super frustrated with how I felt. I felt way too young to feel so old. I had no energy, no libido, couldn't lose the baby weight. And that sitting in his office when he said to me, why don't you take a birth control pill? How about an antidepressant for your PMS? And the math, Sarah, it's exercise more and eat less. That's how you lose weight. And so it was at that moment that I went to the lab and I started studying hormones. And then about six years ago, I tested my blood. I ran an autoimmune panel, which I do in all of my clients and patients. And I was positive for anti-nuclear antibodies. So not just a little bit, but a pretty high level of anti-nuclear antibodies, meaning that my immune system was attacking my cells, the nucleus of my cells, a really core and fundamental, really existential crisis in some ways from a body perspective. And so that kicked off what I think of as a divine process where these things are not happening to me, my hormonal balance in my 30s, my autoimmunity in my 50s. 
they're happening for me. They're happening through me as a way of going deeper, especially with some of these conditions that mainstream medicine can fail. As I started to look at it, I called my friend Mark Hyman, and he told me about this new lab that he launched. And he's had 100,000 people give their blood, mostly pretty healthy people like you and me. And he's found that 30% have positive anti-nuclear antibodies. So we think that there's, we're at a moment in time where the rate of autoimmunity is so much higher than we ever expected. And we know over the past 25 to 30 years that the rate of the body getting confused about what's normal tissue that needs to be protected by the immune system versus pathogens that need to be attacked, that confusion is rapidly increasing. So the reason why I focused on this book is because I saw this link, this exponential rise in autoimmunity. I saw it in myself. And so I set about trying to understand what are the root causes? What are the triggers in my case? What are some of the things that I could fix nutritionally? Is there something beyond a nutrition and supplement protocol that's called for here? And in fact, that is the case. I often think with autoimmune stuff, there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of tangents or arms or avenues that one could go down. And to be honest, I feel that also in autoimmunity, that can feel overwhelming instead of an opportunity, much like when your antibodies were positive, which you were not really much of a minority, it sounds right. It's a huge thing if he's finding it positive in 30% of the labs being run by generally healthy people, right? Finding that functional lab work. I hear you speak optimistically and with curiosity, right? In this good nervous system state of in, instead of with alarm and reaction, as we often are faced with when we face maybe a touch of adversity. And I wonder if it was, that was your initial reaction to your antibodies being elevated or not, or if that came later. That's really the key question. I'm so glad you asked it because, yeah, there's a way that I feel like things are happening to me mm -hmm. when they first occur. And that's not when I share about them. Mm -hmm. I feel like I know enough about this process of a health crisis and what it might be trying to show you that. You have to work through it first before you really talk about it and share it. Mm. Yeah, my initial reaction was, are you kidding? Just when I thought that I got my cortisol into a manageable place and I'm making my way through perimenopause and I'm happy with my body composition and my muscle mass, now my immune system is overactive and attacking my nucleus. But yeah, that was my initial reaction. Mm. And I would say that's the reaction from my childhood. It's a well-worn groove that evolved out of significant childhood adverse experiences, which we talk about in the book, how adverse childhood experiences or ACEs can set you up to have a dysregulated nervous system, a dyspsyche, a dysregulated immune system and dysregulated hormones. I did that out of order, but we're talking about the PINE network here. So psycho and neuroendocrine network. And for me, I spent a lot of time in my 30s in overwhelm. If I think back to my younger self sitting on that exam table at my doctor's office with my list of woes shivering in a thin little gown, my main diagnosis was overwhelm. My main diagnosis was nervous system dysregulation that then later started to affect my immune system. And it was certainly affecting my hormones then. So it's a really good point because it's taken a lot of work with food first, with some supplements that can help with leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability, with embodiment so that I wasn't doing my childhood pattern of a cognitive approach to problems. 
and not spending a lot of time integrated below the neck as well as above the neck. And it took healing states of consciousness, breath work, yoga, psychedelic medicine to really get to a place of having a more regulated approach to the diagnosis of autoimmunity. And the good news is, I'll just give the punchline, going through this process led to now having negative anti-nuclear antibodies. So I no longer have positive anti-nuclear antibodies. And I really credit this protocol that I wrote about in the autoimmune cure to helping me get there. Ooh, there's so much to unpack here. That's really okay. good stuff. I've got it highlighted here. So let's talk about defining before I get into some nuance around boosting and immune system homeostasis, which is the massaging of the conversation that's happening in functional medicine, if you're paying attention, I hope. But so often people want to boost their immune system and it's really about modulation, resilience, maybe management, essentially. And so what do you want to say about that? And then I think that's going to relate to the difference of autoimmunity and autoimmune disease. And maybe we want to make that distinction too while we're out here laying groundwork on what this all is. Immune system boosting versus homeostasis and or autoimmunity and autoimmune disease. Yeah, I appreciate the conversation that's happening in functional medicine. I've practiced functional medicine for about 25 years, so I've got a lot of experience with it and a lot of colleagues who some of them were in that boosting conversation. For me, boosting the immune system feels really masculine. It's crank it up, get it where you need it to be. Instead of a more collaborative feminine approach, which is really the way the immune system is meant to work. So you mentioned homeostasis. When I first started practicing, I realized well, there's something wrong here in conventional medicine. It's so disease-centered. It's not centered around health. And even when you ask thought leaders back then about what is health, they would say it's the absence of disease. And that's such a circuitous way of describing it. And so now I understand health as a state, a very dynamic state of homeostasis, where homeostasis, as was defined as, a sense of inner equilibrium and balance between all of these pathways that you have in the body, biochemical, psychological, spiritual pathways. So a sense of homeostasis and balance, regardless of what's going on externally regardless of what you hear based on your latest lab result. Hmm. So that homeostasis, I think, is really key. And I agree, what we want is homeostasis in the immune system. And part of what's challenging here is that, once again, it is a health hazard to be female. Because when you look at people with autoimmune disease, four out of five are women. Why is that? We know that women have a more robust immune response. That's been documented for decades, especially in response to vaccines. And we know that response, that immune system response, becomes more dysregulated at certain times of hormonal shift, such as pregnancy, postpartum, when a lot of people get diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, such as perimenopause. I saw a huge spike in my perimenopausal women who got vaccinated against COVID. And so it's just an example of how homeostasis can be somewhat tenuous. Women have this more robust immune response, which helps us. It led to a lower mortality rate during the height of the pandemic among women compared to men, but it can backfire and it can lead to a greater problem with tolerance and here I'm talking about physical tolerance, but I think there's a way that women tolerate way too much, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually too. And it can be our downfall. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Homeostasis is the key here. There's a chapter in my book on immunomodulators, things that support the immune system, things like getting five to seven colors of fresh fruits and vegetables in your food every day. Vitamin D, curcumin, lotus naltrexone, and I would also add certain psychedelics as being immune modulators. I want to talk about psychedelics. So I 
hear that through this book writing process, through what year did you have the initial ANA antibodies that were elevated? Was that six years ago? So it was 2017. Okay. So that's, let's go. Seven years ago. And then two years into that, you started formulating the concepts for the book. Is that right? I did. I found those positive ANA. Mm-hmm. And then I started to really look among my patient population to see, okay, are there a lot of people who don't have an autoimmune disease yet who might have some of these blood biomarkers? And I, I started to see them in about a third of my patients. This includes people who've got a relatively normal thyroid function test. So their TSH is good. Their free T3 is good but they've got antibodies against their thyroid. And that's in about 13% of the same uh, patient population that I mentioned earlier with Mark Hyman. So I started to see it in my practice. And I also noticed there's a particular pattern with people with autoimmunity where they often have a flat diurnal uh, curve. So their cortisol first thing in the morning around noon, around four, and before they go to bed is relatively flat, maybe a little high before they go to bed. That is the most immunogenic cortisol pattern that you can find. And it's just part of this dysregulation. As I started to work with people, I saw these hormone changes. I saw these immune changes. I started asking more about trauma and about the triggers for autoimmunity. And I really started to see them everywhere. I'm not saying everyone with autoimmunity has a history of trauma, and I'm not saying that everyone with trauma develops autoimmune disease, but there's a very high correlation between the two. And it was true for me. Yeah. Trauma has been talked about for sure. I hope, I think, for over five years. I think more and more. Sometimes I'm not sure how skewed my perception of this. However, not everyone. I think that there's a huge population, and this is where my heart goes out to, is the people who don't resonate with the word trauma, right? Which is what you're referencing a little bit. We don't resonate with our non-communicative husband being traumatic, for example, right? That may be a trauma response from his own parenting as he grew up. I'm just thinking about things that have come up in conversation just recently. There's so much about our realization. And I guess it is all boiled down to, it's not the stress that kills you, it's the perception of the stress. And it's not necessarily what you think, you logically think of the stress, it's what you're 95% subconscious and what's being stored as the stress. So we know this, but making this tangible for those of us, because I see two sides of this all the time, right? I see the people, and probably you too, when you have this kind of a practice, People come in and they want to do functional medicine treatments and take supplements. And right, you understand that. And then you're trying to, then you start to not be able to avoid or ignore all of these emotional pieces or emotional regulation pieces. And you think, how are we going to bring that to the surface and in conversation and truly in awareness? And you talked a little bit earlier about going from the brain to the heart. The other day I was interviewing Gate Hendricks, who I really appreciated his work. It was very, it really called me out (laughs) when I was reading some of his books. And so we had the conversation about how do you bring about consciousness? How do you bring about awareness? How do you bring about, my favorite term is unrealized stress, right? How do you shine a light on something that's low grade, always been there to where you think it's normal? And you can say that about any kind of symptom too, right? You know, you have this, whatever you have, if you have a stuffy nose and you've always had it, it's so normal. You don't think about it today. Earlier, someone was talking about little sores around the edge of your nose. She said, I never even thought about it because it was so normal. Yeah. Little signs and symptoms. That's nice when there's a tangible exterior sign, right? But how do you start to draw that connection? And how do you help people realize their unrealized stress? This is a hard question. It's the key question. So I really love that you post it. What I want people to understand is what I had to learn, which is... We think of overwhelming emotional experiences, which is the definition of trauma. We think of those as being associated with mental health effects. We think of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, disordered eating, attention deficit disorder. And yet the physical body is also affected by these experiences of overwhelming 
and distressful events. And as you described, there's a way that trauma has become a buzzword, and I think it's maybe losing its meaning for some people. So we could just insert overwhelming emotional events here. The great, there, the great new term. I'm gonna I'm gonna start using that all the time. <laughs> well, I like to realize stress, so we might have to use that too. There's the capital T drama or overwhelming stressful events that we could all agree are traumatic. You lose someone you love suddenly or you survive a genocide. And then there's these other events that maybe you're speaking into. Being in a marriage where you just don't feel emotionally attuned. You don't feel seen. Maybe you're even sacrificing your authenticity to securely attach or to have some sort of level of attachment. Maybe it's a toxic job, a toxic work culture. So there's these other events that can also get under the skin. And one of the things that Gabor Mate talks about in The Myth of Normal is that it's not so much the event that happened to you, it's the way it lives on in your body. It's the way it lives on in your pine network, especially because that's a forward facing part of your body that is dealing with these unrealized stressors. My work is initially, I went through the portal of hormones. And so dealing with cortisol issues, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, insulin with my clients has been a big part of my career. But it's really just the tip of the iceberg, because as you dig deeper and deeper, you find that there's all these other signs of dysregulation. I think part of what you were asking is, how do you know? And I think the way is that you've got some kind of condition, usually a chronic condition that's not getting better. Or what I see commonly in my practice is that people take two to three steps forward and then they backslide. That's especially true with autoimmune conditions. And so looking for some of these signs of dysregulation, looking for when it comes to the immune system, there's some basic tests that you can do to look for this, such as a complete blood cell count and a differential and looking at the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, the NLR. You can also look at inflammation, but inflammatory tone level of high sensitivity C-reactive protein, sedimentation rate, a measure of how sticky the blood is. And then you can do more advanced blood testing of the immune system. You can do a lymphocyte map. You can do an antibody panel. I run in all of my executives and professional athletes that I see at Thomas Jefferson. And then when it comes to the nervous system, I think one of the best measures is heart rate variability. And I know you used to someone recently about that, so I'm not going to get into the details of it. And while your guest was totally accurate and talked about how you can't compare yourself to other people because some of it's genetically determined, some of it's based on your fitness and your endurance base. It's also true that there are some low levels that are associated with being incredibly dysregulated, significantly dysregulated, such that I imagine if I measured my heart rate variability when I was sitting in that doctor's office in my 30s, I imagine it was really low. And so there are these outer measures, and certainly wearables can help you track these things, because one of the things we know for people who have experienced significant toxic stress is that many of us become poor historians, and we become disembodied. I even write in a book about how I was functionally dissociated. Yeah, I get it. Me too. <laughs> yeah. And I think being a clinician, hey, that is revered to be functionally dissociated, to be up here solving problems all day long. And oh no, I don't want to go down into the rest of my body and have to deal with the stress response. That's too much work. Yeah. So when you're a poor historian, you need some of these more objective measures to just see is dysregulation true for me? Because I think we're more dysregulated now than I've ever seen in my entire life. I think that's a really po good question to take, to underline, to put in our toolbox. Is dysregulation true for me? 
I think another one, I think what I hear from you is you've been on a little bit of this journey. And I think we have some similarities based on some of the things you are into, because I remember at least four years ago, I was like, I could see that stress was the problem, but I just needed to unravel my own history and my own healing journey that I didn't know I needed, right? So I just started trying modalities, right? I ended up seeing a psychic I didn't know was a psychic. (laughs) I did psychedelic, right? Because I had friends, colleagues I really respected. They were saying, this changed my life. This healed my relationship with my mother, right? Didn't even know these were issues. And I often think, and it's so good to have all of these experiences. It's a lovely thing. And in short, there's no shortage of opportunities. But I just, some things don't work for certain people. To me, I prefer breathwork over psychedelics based on some experiences, right? I could change my mind about that in a few years. Who knows? We have lots of research. And I think about this, and I think for people who are really up in their head, it totally, on a really tangible, visceral level, I feel, it just completely changes how you're experiencing your body. So it gives people this opportunity to have new sensations that they have been ignoring, suppressing, whatever. That's This is just my feelings at the moment. And I feel like you have also experimented with a lot of things as you went through this, your own healing journey. We'll call it a healing journey, whatever. I don't know how you want to call it, but I feel like you have sampled a lot of things. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the things that you have sampled, or if you want to take a moment to talk about psychedelics here, because I know you're passionate about this topic, I think. Yes, very passionate. So I feel like I had to start by saying I was total square. I didn't smoke pot. I didn't take mushrooms in college. I was in the library all yeah, the time. For sure. And, and that was also, in some ways, a response to my childhood. I had a somewhat volatile childhood. I've got an A score of six. My parents got divorced. I grew up without my father in the picture. And so I learned that academic achievement was a way to get the love and attention that I wanted. And so I never experimented until I had an experience in my 50s where I had a falling out with someone that I love. And we became estranged, this person that I was really close to. And as I started to look at my side of the street, I felt like I'm reactive. And if I'm not going to clear up this way that trauma is still living on in my system and leading to conflict and estrangement with someone that I love, if not now, when? So that really got me to open to the possibility of taking some of these medications that I've always stayed away from, plant medicines. I'd always done yoga. I practiced yoga since I was five years old, and I learned meditation when I was a teenager. So I had those things. But I would say even those things, yoga and meditation, weren't enough. They weren't enough to shift some of that unrealized stress out of my system. So the first thing I tried was holotropic breath work. And I've been doing that for about three years. And it's it's something that I write about quite a bit in the book, and I review all the latest literature on it. And I found that to be really powerful. It was a way to create a healing state of consciousness. Some would call it even psychedelic without taking any medication. And so the way that you breathe with holotropic breath work, I would do it for 20 minutes and I would feel so regulated as a result. So I practiced that four times a week for a couple of years, found it to be really helpful. But this was right around the time that. MDMA-assisted therapy was being studied in clinical trials. And we were starting to see that the gold standard of how we treat trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, or what I see more commonly is partial PTSD or subthreshold PTSD. That's what I see. Hypervigilance, nightmares, fear response, exaggerated startle response, cortisol issues. Those are some of the things that I see in my practice. And the gold standard is usually talk therapy, sometimes trauma-informed, but not always. And then 
that sometimes is combined with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And there's three that are FDA approved for PTSD. And yet the efficacy of those two things, talk therapy and SSRIs, is around 30%. 30%. So when I started talk therapy in my 20s for my first round of depression, if they told me that going to weekly psychotherapy at quite a bit of an expense and a big time commitment, that my chances of resolving my trauma were 30%, I don't think I would have done it. Fortunately, we've got more options now for dealing with PTSD that might be more effective, but not a lot of long-term studies. But when you look at MDMA-assisted therapy, so here we're talking about two to three journeys with MDMA combined with therapy, so used in a therapeutic, not a recreational context. The efficacy is somewhere around 67 to 71 percent. That's how many people no longer meet criteria for PTSD after two to three sessions. So it's pretty dramatic, yeah. more than double as effective as the gold standard. And that's what got me. That was my gateway. So I started MDMA-assisted therapy, and it really made a difference. I went through certification with MAPS. I've done the level one training. Level two is not open until they get FDA approved right now. And then I've also gone through three certifications with ketamine and with and one with psilocybin. These medicines are really interesting because they allow you to go back to some of that unrealized stress, those events that have occurred to you, but to approach it with fresh eyes, to approach it without the usual fear response, without the amygdala going, oh, there's the threat. Mm. And when you're able to do that, especially inside of a really solid therapeutic container, it can make a big difference. It doesn't have to be a psychedelic medicine. There's lots of ways to create a healing state of consciousness. But I found nothing more effective for the dysregulation that I felt in my nervous system. But I also think many of us need, especially if we had trauma before age three, we need daily nervous system regulation. I think we, we all need daily nervous system regulation. If you want your immune system to be homeostatic, it's at least 50% in my very humble opinion. Okay, so what I'm hearing from you, and I want to just lay this out because part of the complaint with healing is it's like a little ambiguous. <laughs> so I'm just going to lay a little bit of a map here for us to follow along with. I think this is also a bias. I think the first step is always awareness. And you can go so far with your cognitive awareness, right? You talked about, and I am right here with you, that certain types of breath work can be a little bit like a psychedelic. Now, that said, now I also would like to use you as an inspiration to go dig into all of the literature related to breath work in this, because there is literature and you're very interested in the literature on psychedelics now. So when that is then not enough, and I understand what happens in the brain there, I understand that you may access theta state waves that allow you to access memory, <laughs> memory, healing, creativity, right? Ancient memories. When people are on these healing journeys, now this is an interesting topic. Not that many years ago, I just gave up on recommending CBD years ago because of rules and regulations at the time. Now it's not really a big deal at all, but in a similar but different way. These journeys have drugs, they're drug-assisted journeys in theory, right? That's how we classify them now, that have regulations, as you said, that are waiting to be passed. And so I think there's a little bit of, I don't know if this is the right or privilege around being able to use this, like how do people access someone, right? It's still a small niche of people. And so what's happening here is it's a psilocybin or mushroom journey. It's a MDMA or Molly or ecstasy journey. And I don't know if there was another, was there, oh, ketamine. Can you tell me a little bit about ketamine? Isn't that a little bit easier to access? I feel like where I live in the middle of nowhere, you can get ketamine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ketamine is widely available because it's a uh, anesthetic. So I've used it for 30 years. I started it, my medical training in 1994 at UCSF. It's the number one anesthetic that we use for children in the emergency room. And so we've learned that there's the anesthetic doses, and then at about one-tenth of that, 
you can see psychedelic effects. So how ketamine is being used sublingually as a lozenge intravenously and also intramuscularly. It's also FDA approved as an intranasal spray for mm-hmm. treatment resistant depression. So it's interesting. Ketamine at low doses can be empathogenic, heart opening, and at the higher doses within the range that we're talking about therapeutically, not as an anesthetic, it can be more entheogenic. So ketamine is very interesting. It's really versatile. It's legal. It's used off-label, but it's something that you can access pretty readily. So I live in Northern California where we've got a ketamine clinic, it seems like, on every street corner. Mm -hmm. And I don't totally agree with the medicalization of it. I don't think you should be in an IV chair getting ketamine without any therapy. I don't think that's the right And I appreciate the point that you made about privilege and niche. What we're now seeing as we're on the cusp of this revolution with psychedelic medicine is that Trauma is such a common part of our experience. And if you take more of a public health view, we're going to shift away from that one-on-one kind of privilege situation with psychedelic medicine toward more of a group and peer process. So that's a trend that I see. It's something that we're studying in a nonprofit that I'm part of. Mm -hmm. And that feels really helpful to me, that group process with these healing states of consciousness has the promise to be much more accessible, affordable, and to treat some of the systemic problems that we have. And what about healing and community? Do we have research and evidence around healing happens in community because you feel seen, heard, that you're not the only person going through that issue or pain? If you're urinating a lot when you're drinking water, maybe you're not actually hydrating that much. Or in other words, getting the fluid and nutrients into the cell. Electrolytes are minerals that help fluid and nutrients get into the cell. I recommend all of my clients start by drinking electrolytes when we begin our work together to improve energy. And then we get even more strategic with our electrolyte recommendations as test results come in. Now, generally, electrolytes are potassium, sodium, and chloride. One of my favorite electrolyte products is Pickleball Cocktail from Jigsaw Health because it's one of the only products you can get with an adequate dose of potassium to meet my recommendations, which is critical for blood sugar, which everyone should care about, hormone health, and digestion. Huge thing for relapsing digestive issues. Jigsaw Health is also maker of the famous adrenal cocktail, made popular by the pro-metabolic corner of the internet and root cause protocol, as well as a multi-mineral electrolyte for recovery called Electrolyte Supreme. You can get a discount on all of Jigsaw's amazing products, including pickleball, Electrolyte Supreme and Adrenal Cocktail at jigsawhealth.com with the code less stressed 10. That's three S's less stressed 10. Yeah, it makes me slow down a little bit to answer this question because I think it's so critical. And it's something that I never learned in medical school. When I went through my medical training, I got almost no nutrition. I don't think anyone said a word about trauma. And we never talked about healing and community. And what I've learned is that. If you look at a group of people going through some sort of process together, so one of the things I used to do is to lead detoxes. We call them detoxes, but they're really functional medicine approaches to healing the gut. That's just harder to market than detox. And I get it. (laughs) What we found was that the people who had accountability partners, the people who paired up with someone else and they had more of a community engagement, they had more than double the benefit in terms of tracking things like Q, medical symptom questionnaires. Community definitely makes a huge difference. And I would say from the perspective of trauma, we're still learning. How do we, yes, we think community is important. Yes, we think oxytocin is a big part of that healing. We think that reaching across the issues of loneliness and isolation that we have so much in our culture right now, and we certainly had during the pandemic, that's really important in terms of healing. And this isn't, I take your point about the vagueness, the ambiguity of the way that sometimes we talk about healing. And there is hard science behind this. If you just, we think of 
you and me as these two stable human beings who don't change that much. Maybe we improve a little bit with some of these healing states of consciousness. But we are, we've got these social genomics, even on Zoom, that are changing constantly, right? The way that your DNA is being expressed, the way that you methylate, the amount of oxidative stress that you make, your immune cells, all of those are changing as we talk. Same thing on my end. So there's a way that there's something that happens in dyads and in communities related to social genomics, related to the pine network, that's very different than what happens in isolation. I think when I say that the healing is, there's some ambiguity, is because we're not exactly the same, but we have more in common than we think. And so what it boils down to is what is the aha moment for this person versus this person that kind of makes them click and head down a path to heal their different parts. And I think a lot of as I researched this area that I had no education around either, attachment theory and other things, these things, when you are, it's just like in functional medicine, when you have a test that's positive, you feel, and you don't feel well, you feel validated. And so in a similar way, when you're able to self-diagnose is the word I'm just going to choose here, an attachment issue, you can either live in that space or maybe you just feel like, oh, I am not the only person like this and that there's a series of steps maybe after this part. In a similar way, I think even though maybe clinicians see this, we see these pieces, there are many options, modalities, et cetera, for nervous system healing. When we bake this together and bring it back to autoimmune, and in the word, the book is called Autoimmune Cure, which is a spicy word for a medical professional, right? But your other books were also called Cure, right? And if you want to comment on that, comment. I welcome it too, because it's, I think we were always like, I feel when I see that word, I almost feel like my hand just got slapped, <laughs> right? Because it was like, well, we don't talk about, about there is no curing anything. You now have this thing. And so even just the choice of our words so often, actually, I'm going to stop there and let you talk about the word cure. And then let's weave around and talk a little bit about the healing map with autoimmunity. You've piecemealed it here and there, but I just want to make sure we wrap it in a bow for sure before we finish up. So cure. Keyword. Why that word? Oh, there's a lot of things I was taught in my medical training. I was taught, and I, I think patriarchy is alive and well in mainstream medicine. I was taught that you never talk about yourself. You only talk about cases. You never share your personal story. And you certainly never talk about cure. But once I turned toward functional and integrative medicine, I found that cure happened all the time. That the idea that, say, an autoimmune disease can go into remission, I don't think that quite captures the process that someone can go through and the transformation that they can experience. And I think the word cure does. It captures the transformation. So that's why I very intentionally use it and this idea that you don't use cure in your language as a medical profession, we need a new model. Hmm. On that note, let's talk about a model for autoimmune healing, because I feel like there's several pieces. And so I'd like to, I'd like to come up with steps, pieces, whatever I'd like us to for sure discuss. Let's say, do you ever hear this statement? I, I've tried everything, right? I'm like, that might be the most broken record thing I've ever heard in practice. I've tried everything. And I'm like, oh, it sounds like you've just tried a few pieces of a certain section. <laughs> so tell me how you itemize, categorize how you, the steps you might go through if you were looking at the opportunities in the autoimmune situation. I'm an engineer, so I'm systems-based thinking. And when you look at what's required to develop autoimmune disease, Alessio Fasano at Massachusetts General Hospital, a pediatric gastroenterologist, described a triad. And that triad is genetic predisposition together with increased intestinal permeability and then a trigger. And so we've talked about some triggers that can occur. The issue with that triad is that you can't do much about your genetic predisposition, although you might be able to make some changes with your epigenetics. That's another conversation. 
But with leaky gut and with your response to triggers, you have a lot of power to change those things. So if you start with leaky gut, what we know is that an elimination diet that's well-designed, that goes through a rigorous process of eliminating the most immunogenic foods, the foods that really trigger your immune system potentially, and then adding them back one at a time very carefully and methodically, that's been shown to improve leaky gut. And here I'm using leaky gut as a proxy for increased intestinal permeability. We also know that addressing gut health, especially the dysbiosis that we see that's associated with increased intestinal permeability, can make a big difference. So part of my path with this is paying keen attention to my patients. And I had a patient with Crohn's disease who had a segment of his colon, he had colonic Crohn's, removed, about a nine centimeter segment. He's a case in the book. And when he recovered from the surgery, his high sensitivity C-reactive protein was like 27 the day that he had surgery. And now it's less than one. And a big part of our work was microbiome restoration working on his gut health. And there's never just one thing that really moves the needle for people. But one of the things that really worked for him was that he would have a smoothie every day. He would go to the farmer's market and he would get 50 plus fresh fruits and vegetables in season. And he would make a smoothie out of it. And he would use that to feed the benevolent microbes in his gut. And he would make a big batch, freeze it, and then drink about six ounces a day. And inside of a few months, he dramatically changed his microbiome. And I would say he has a cure. He's a very rigorous scientist, so he would say that he's in remission with his Crohn's disease. That's leaky gut. And there's also supplements that can be helpful, L-glutamine, aloe vera some more proven than others. But that brings us to the triggers. The map with triggers is to really understand what they are. And what I'm listening for when I'm taking a patient's history, when I'm listening to their story, I'm listening for, I was fine until, and then there was a moment my mother died, or I got a divorce, or I had my baby, and it was traumatic. So I'm listening for what the trigger or triggers might be in somebody. And addressing those triggers, I think, is really critical because those triggers, there's this line that you hear in spiritual work, never waste a good trigger. Really understanding what your triggers are and using those as part of your map for what to address. For me, one of my triggers was this falling out I had with a, a person I loved. That was an important trigger related to relationship that I needed to pay attention to. It's really normal for us to want to not feel that stuff. And when you say triggers, I think about other ways to make it relate to someone. And I think it's what you're thinking about all day. You're distracted by. It's like the monkey on your back or just like what's taking up rent-free space in your brain. I feel like that might be a trigger. Just saying. It's like what you can't, what pops in your mind when you try to have stillness, right? What, what's stressing you out? Yeah, John Donahue, the poet from Ireland, also talks about this. He talks about how we all have seven ideas that we just think about over and over again. Mm -hmm. And you're married to them. Mm -hmm. Did you consent? Are they really the seven thoughts <laughs> that you want to keep recirculating? <laughs> <laughs> Having that red free space? Like maybe we want to be more intentional about those seven thoughts. I have never personally taken an autoimmune intake or history without that stressful trigger, that strong trigger. And to your point, when you said earlier, hormones and autoimmunity aren't really separate. I take a very, I'm sure like you do, root cause approach to hormones. I think about here's all the things that make hormones function well. But as an aside, when I see a very low testosterone, I've started to just recognize what trauma trigger did you have here? 
I'm not sure there's a ton of other reasons I've seen this such depleted, unless you have a genetic reason for this. So triggers are vast and broad. And I even think just to expand on the microbiome piece, that there's sometimes things affecting microbiome. I would put it in that umbrella, like fungal toxic toxicity and that kind of burden, just so we're not accidentally pigeonholed. And I don't know, you can disagree with me, but I just want to say that there's some other things things that might fit in that bucket that would be stressing to the gut overall, which stresses the immune system. Tell me where... Yeah, for sure. Fungal overgrowth, parasites, there's lots of things that can cause uh, dysregulation in the Mm -hmm. gut. Tell me where you are now in year seven of this healing journey. I know you now have the book out, but there was a lot of processes and I'm stumbling over your name change a little bit. Do you want to talk about that at all? Sure. I want to be respectful of my ex-husbands. Let me tread carefully. I went through a divorce last year, and that was after 20 years of marriage. So I've got two daughters. The youngest one went off to college. And as we looked at our empty nest, there were ways that I felt like this relationship just wasn't the sanctuary that I believe a marriage should be. And I recently heard Nicole LaPera talking about bare minimum fathers and bare minimum mothers. And that really struck a chord for me because there's a way that what you experienced growing up, what you witnessed, you then accept. Unless you do a lot of work around it. And I had done that. So I had a trauma bond with my ex-husband. And there was a way that our trauma kind of interlocked my abandonment, his need for more independence and not to be engulfed. And yeah, a big part of my process of realizing that I grew up as someone who sacrificed authenticity for attachment and realized that I was doing it in my marriage We tried for half the marriage to address this. We were in couples therapy for half of it. And we just realized we're still dysregulating each other. And it's not a little bit. It's significant. It's high blood sugar elevations. It's high resting heart rate. It's high cortisol levels. It's a low heart rate variability. It's a low level of resilience. And once you get to a point in marriage where you've got that kind of bi-directional dysregulation, that's a problem. That's harder to fix. So I completed my divorce, and there's a way that the second half of life for me, so I'm in my 50s, I'm just really excited, and I want to work on transformation. I want to help other people who struggles similarly with some of these things that we've been talking about. I'm excellent at functional medicine. I can help people recalibrate their gut. I can help people get their hormones to a much better place. I can talk about genomics and how those interact with biomarkers. But in some ways, that's less interesting to me than this more core work of transformation and regulation. And also, if there are things I can do to regulate someone else, to be of service in that way. Like if our podcast today could co-regulate our listeners, that's what I most I hear you have lived in your zone of excellence for a long time, and now you're really wanting to step into your zone of genius of transformation and regulation is what I hear you saying. So I... I understand. I have all of these similar wavelengths. And on a positive note, when we think about family structures being a huge piece of our sense of not safety and dysregulation, I had a bit of a look at my own life. I haven't talked about this a lot on the podcast yet, although I intend to, because I think it's important. And it's just, to your point, I think if it can help someone realize their own accidental stress faster, then life is achieved, I guess, of <laughs> achieved fulfillment. But in a similar way, long story short, I was observing my family system with my children, et cetera. And I just had all of these feelings like, oh, everything is a reflection of where I am, much to where you said, 
what you witness is what you accept. And I heard you talk about your divorced parents. And so sometimes those treatments of those things show up. They're, that's talked about, right? We seek that in our mate and whatnot. But the point of my story, the brief comment here is just that I started to observe that, oh, my 10-year-old is reactive and angry. Where am I being reactive and angry? And I just started really being very curious and very witnessing of everything I could be doing. And I made, I just very quickly, it was, it. I had already been on a healing journey, right? So I had nervous system tools. I just, I became almost vigilant, right? About just tending to the nervous system and being a witness of that. And within a, a maximum of three weeks, I started to just see the changes positively ripple, right? And so I shared that just because it's, I think, an important piece. So often, and just this morning in my, I have a, a call with clients if they want to show up and ask like a group call questions. And someone asked me today about their baby's microbiome. And so often it's, it depends on yours. <laughs> it, you are the mirror of all these things. And so that would be an invitation I would extend as we go forth and, and start to finish up our conversation here is look at where you are mirroring all those things. And this is talked about, right? This is not a new concept. But look at where these things are mirroring and just get really curious about life. And for you, what advice do you want to give the listener? And then where can people find you online? I love this point about mirroring. Mm. I feel like our biggest job as mothers, whether that's to a child or to an adult or a mission, is to be a clean mirror. I really want to honor you for that particular story. And it's similar to. When you have a new baby, when you've got an infant, we're meant to co-regulate that infant just to hold the baby close and soothe the baby because the baby hasn't learned with their nervous system how to do that for themselves yet. And so they look to parents, mostly the mother, to do that. So I so appreciate that point that you made. So I would say a takeaway that I really want people to understand is that while you may feel dysregulated, while you might feel maybe like a bit of a victim and overwhelmed by a recent diagnosis or even having mysterious symptoms that no one can seem to get to a cause for or put a label on or diagnose, once you experience regulation, once you experience that sense of peace and equilibrium in your system, and it feels enduring, there's no going back. There's no going back. And it's easier to get into this place of regulation than it is to live with the misery of that dysregulation. So I hope people understand that and hear it as an invitation to learn what's the a la carte menu of which you want to try to regulate mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah. I'd like everyone to have like their top three. What's your top three, Krista? To regulate my nervous system. So I, I have to, top two for sure. I have breath work. If I don't do a longer breath work, a 20 to 30 minutes every week, if I go more than two weeks, I am not a good person anymore. So at least weekly is my bare minimum for that. The second thing is some version of coaching. And so coaching is, it's a little bit of an ambiguous model, but it's essentially a little bit of, it's, I think about it as math problem solving. And it's like oversimplifying problems, right? By using a structure, right? Like circumstances, thoughts, feelings, result, actions, results, basically. And so I love tools in that realm that help me plug things in. And then from there, I don't know, I'm just really, I'm really adamant about sleep, to be honest, right? I see a lot of really brilliant, smart people doing revenge bedtime stuff and just not getting sleep because they're like, I must achieve and achieve. And that's our. That's just an extension of our desire to just do and not be able to sit and rest and feel like you deserve rest. So I'm just going to play an easy card, like a wild card here and say I'm really just adamant about getting proper sleep. It's <laughs> beautiful. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah, I'll go with it. Works for me. And you, what are yours? And also, I saw, I was scrolling your Instagram before we got on this, and I saw you asking people what their word of the year was, and I didn't get to bring this up yet. And I want to ask you your word of the year. Mine is, I haven't talked about this either. Mine is embodiment, which just means I'm just so open to all of these different modalities, right? And actually doing the thing. It's like 
the feelings of fraud we have as medical providers, I feel, <laughs> when we end up in this health crisis ourselves, right? It's, oh, I have not embodied this stuff. And I think you said it in different words earlier. It's if you haven't healed your thing, maybe don't teach other people how to heal it yet. And so you have to really step into that embodiment piece. And that's what I'm hanging out in is the embodiment of the less stressed life. And I'll tell you where this comes up. This podcast has been called the less stressed life since 2017 as a synonym for inflammation. And yeah. I really think we need to just be calling it in pursuit of the less stressed life. Like it's <laughs> not that you get to necessarily. It's we're pursuing that. We believe it's accessible, you know, an option for everyone. So embodiment for me, I'd love to hear about your word and your top three. My word of the month is regulation. Mm -hmm. So this is my sixth book. And my hope was to not be on a plane every single week and be doing, to not be saying yes to everything, but to be much more selective about congruence and alignment with what I say yes to. And my word of the year for, I've been doing this for 19 years with my best friend. Mm -hmm. And there were a few years, I think like 2020 until about 2022, where my word was embodiment. And my best friend and I go hiking on New Year's Day and we come up with our word. And her point was in 2022, she's like, wait, that was your word last year and the year before that. Like, <laughs> how long is this going to take? Yeah, it's reasonable. Okay, good. Thanks for letting me know. I might be working on that for a couple of years. I appreciate it. It's, it's good. a good project yeah. and it was, it's not a destination. So the things that I find are the most regulating are certainly breath work. And I've experimented with a lot of things over the years. I heard you talking about Joe Dispenza, and I'm really enjoying some of his work right now. And I'm using a new app that does some theta activation. So working with that right now. The second is psychedelic medicine. As I've said, I just think it's a, it's an accelerator in the right patient population with the right people, with the right support and container. Third, orgasm. Mm. I think the female body especially is designed for pleasure and orgasm is just one of our ways of regulating, especially when it's done correctly. And then I'm going to say a fourth, which has been such a surprise to me, heavy weight lifting. Mm -hmm. So I've really embraced this over the past year and it's just shocking to me how much it regulates my nervous system when I'm doing it, when I'm noticing I'm doing like a deep squat and I'm noticing the difference right, left. I'm noticing what I'm storing in my pelvis. So regulating. And so it's that embodiment that I really yeah. was for. So those are my top four. Yeah. And I think what I hear is also proper structure is involved in your heavy weight lifting, right? Because there's all that conversation about what are you storing in your pelvis also. And I am now going to add another one also, which is really in a new hobby to enjoy, right? I started, I'm very slowly plucking my way through a guitar because I love these stories of learning things as you get older. And so I've been plucking around on a guitar for a couple of months and going to lessons. So funny to, one, learn something as an adult, right? Showing up, doing lessons, and sitting down and realizing, wow, this is, feels so good with my nervous system to just enjoy this thing, like some creative expression. So I just wanted to share that also. Where can people well, find you online? So the best ways, places to go to my website, sarah.readmd.com. And I hang out mostly on Instagram, so that's a good place to interact with me. And that's also at Sarah Gottfried, MD. Perfect. I thank you so much for coming on today. And I am going to insert one last question for the audience because we were talking about psychedelics. And I just wanted to know if you had any knowledge about, I feel that I see studies happening in the VAs for psychedelics. And this is just like, I have a little heartstrings for this. And so this is some of the places I watch trauma playing out in front of my eyes right now is with my dad starting to, maybe become a little more aware of his Vietnam trauma and, and then also seeing it with my sister who was an Iraqi war veteran. And so anyway, since you are, have this training, is this happening in VAs and how do people find out about it? It is. It's really exciting. The VA yeah. is going through such a, a process right now. They're switching or they're embracing whole health. And the MAP studies that have been published, the two randomized trials of phase three 
with MDMA-assisted therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. The VA very wisely said, that's a different patient population than the veterans that we take care of. So they want to do their own studies in veterans with MDMA-assisted therapy. So that is being done right now. And I would really encourage people who are veterans to look into that research, especially before MDMA is FDA approved. You really want to be in a research setting. You want to be all above ground with how you're doing some of these uh, psychedelic medicines. So I would say look into the research that's being done at the VA where they're trying to replicate what's been done in a severe PTSD population, which was the first phase three MDMA-assisted therapy trial. And then the second trial was with moderate to severe PTSD. The first trial had mostly white participants, so there's a real bias. The second trial was 50% non-white. And so we need to know in a VA population, do you see the same efficacy of 67 to 71%? Cool. Thank you so much for indulging in that last question. And thank you so much. Of course. For Good one. I want to hear these bones, but they just keep breaking.